So tonight we're going to start a new series for the next month or so. We're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about Jesus' life some more, and we're going to also talk about people that played a role in his life and what the role was that they played. And then we're going to try and apply those things to our own lives, and um, you know maybe solve some of the problems that we face. Maybe I'm the only one with problems, but I'm just assuming. <laughs> um, <laughs> so tonight we're going to read from um, Mark 1, and the, um, the passage is bookmarked in the Bibles. It's on page 927, and it's uh, Mark 1, 9 through 12. You can grab one of those, Bill. Carl's got his in his lap. And we're reading verses 9 through 12, Mark 1. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens bring, being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. This is a story that we're very familiar with. Um, John is John the Baptist. Jesus and John were somehow related um, because their mothers were somehow related. And um, John had um, started his ministry before Jesus did. What I want to talk about, though, is Jesus and, and a particular relationship in this story. The, earlier in January, we talked about Jesus when he was young and when he was a boy and a young man and the things that happened in his life and what his life was probably like. So from the age of 12 when he's in the temple until now, the scriptures are pretty silent. And that's a big chunk of his life. And so we can make assumptions just because the Bible doesn't say anything we kind of assume that there was nothing outstanding happening during those years. He probably continued to work with Joseph in his trade, whatever that was. He continued to observe the Sabbath. He continued to observe um, all of those um, pilgrimage feasts that where he had to go to Jerusalem every year. His life was probably very, very ordinary. And when I thought about that, I thought about how many times in my life, and there's a few years in there to count, and how many other people haven't I talked to who complain about an ordinary life. We want to do something. We want to be somebody. We want to achieve something. And yet Jesus spent the bulk of his life just being an ordinary guy. And I, I just found that interesting and really chastising to me for, you know, not necessarily appreciating ordinary. About the time he turned 30 is when this story happened. And John had started teaching a new teaching to the people. And what he was telling everyone was that we're sinners and we need to repent. That was his big message. And for Judaism, that was huge because, because Jews were very works-oriented. They had to do this and this and this and this, and Jesus talks about it throughout the Gospels. And so for John to say, no, you're a sinner and you need to repent, was kind of a new idea for them. And people would often get baptized when they were going to follow a new teaching. And so John the Baptist baptized a lot of people because they understood what he was saying. And so he was very surprised when Jesus came to be baptized because what did Jesus have to repent of? But needless to say, um, Jesus went and, uh, and decided that, that he needed to do this at this time. But I don't want to focus on the baptism itself. I want to focus on who appeared at his baptism 
And I know I said I talk about people, but I'm just going to talk about relationships. And they may not always be people. Because who appeared at his baptism as soon as he was baptized was the Holy Spirit. And it says he appeared as a dove. And it's interesting that at the start of Jesus' human ministry <coughs> that we see the Trinity. We see Jesus in his human form. We, we hear God the Father speaking. And we see uh, something that represents the Holy Spirit. And so I think this was a very memorable occasion because we don't really get to see them together. We read about, you know, God being multiple personalities, you know, all rolled into one. But we don't get to see that. And, but I don't want to focus on the Trinity either. I think it's interesting that the Holy Spirit shows up at the launch of Jesus' ministry. So for all these years, he's been ordinary. We don't know the relationship he had with the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit was around in his life or not. But we know that the Holy Spirit shows up when Jesus begins to do the work that he was called to do. This is also an important enough occasion that another disciple wrote about it. In Matthew, there's another account. And if you read the account in Matthew, there's quite the conversation between John and Jesus about whether or not he should be baptized or not. But again, I want to focus on the Holy Spirit, and that's why I chose the, the Mark version of it. What I also find interesting is that Jesus is starting his ministry. He knows that he's you know, what he's got to do, what he's here on earth for. The Holy Spirit shows up, and the Holy Spirit immediately gives him instructions what to do. He tells him that he has to go into the wilderness. Now, we know that God's presence itself changed over time. We talk, we've talked about it in previous weeks. You know, in the beginning, God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. We know that later on that he made appearances to the patriarchs. We know that there were periods of silence. We know that God chose to appear in different forms at different times to different people. Now that Jesus is on the earth in his human form, things are going to change. And the Holy Spirit is that change. Jesus was here on earth, and he knew that he needed to, um, to raise up people to follow him, to follow in his footsteps, to carry on the work that he was starting. So he knew that he, he, that he had a job that was going to take him a little bit of time to do. And he had the Holy Spirit with him doing that. Jesus knew, and God knew, that this was the dawn of a new era. God wasn't going to walk in the garden, not until he comes again, until there's a new heaven and a new earth. We're not going to get to walk with him. And this was a time when things were going to be changing. Jesus knew it, and he was preparing for it. Today's church, there are some churches that really downplay the Holy Spirit. And I hope by the end of tonight you have, a, have an appreciation um, for him in a little different way. But some churches really downplay the Holy Spirit, and they only give him a couple of kudos, you know, in the scripture, even though he's there throughout the Bible. Other churches elevate him to a level that's too high, and it's almost that you go into that church and they're worshiping the Holy Spirit and have forgotten the rest of the Trinity. And so I, that's why I think it's important for us to talk about the Holy Spirit and to discover him and figure out what his appearance that day meant. So in that scripture, there's a few things that we, that we know. First of all, he was silent. And we don't always appreciate silence. And yet, this appearance didn't bring any words, didn't bring any fanfare, didn't bring anything with it. And he appeared as a dove. And usually when we think of doves, we think of peace and tranquility. And I thought about it because Jesus 
wasn't about peace and tranquility. He was quite the rebel of a teacher. He brought new ideas that people hadn't heard before. And so I went to Wikipedia, and this is what they say about doves. And I knew all of this, but I'd never put it together, and it was kind of interesting. What Wikipedia says is that doves, usually white in color, are used in a lot of settings as symbols of love, peace, or as messengers. Doves appear in the symbolism of Judaism, Christianity, and paganism, and both of military and pacifist groups. Everybody wants a dove. <laughs> uh, there's, there's obviously some importance there. Immediately um, after the baptism, this happened. And I think that that's key too. Here was Jesus who had nothing to repent of, who um, certainly had not committed any sins, but he wanted to be baptized. And I think that that emphasizes how important a public statement of who you are and what you believe is. And some Christians make very light of baptism. I think that this story shows us how important baptism is, why it's considered sacred or holy, why the church calls it a sacrament. We need to remember that, um, that this was something that Jesus did himself. And why don't we want to be like him? That's what we're told to do. Then that last verse that um, the Holy Spirit um, drove him into the wilderness. There's a couple of things that I think are interesting in that verse. And we're going to actually study that verse again next week with the following verses. But the Spirit was in the driver's seat. I thought about all the pictures I've seen on Facebook and stuff. And there's Jesus as the pilot of a plane, and you're supposed to be the co-pilot. No, the Holy Spirit's the pilot. Even Jesus allowed the Holy Spirit to be his pilot. And are we ready to let somebody else take the controls? Are we ready to surrender all of that? And that's a real struggle for most of us. I, I think it goes against human nature. I say that because then I don't feel so bad when I struggle. <laughs> that is my human nature. The other thing is that as soon as he started his ministry, the Holy Spirit started giving him directions. And I think when people become Christians for the first time or feel some kind of a call on their life, you know, they sit around and they flounder. And I think, again, we're not helping each other to figure out what direction God wants us to go. Because I don't think God necessarily wants us to, just, to, to do that, to do that floundering. Now, there's a few more things I'd like to point out about the Holy Spirit. I like to think the Holy Spirit was kind of Jesus' BFF here on earth. They were, you know, best buds. Because clearly they were together. In um, Luke, we're told that the Holy Spirit was there at Christ's conception. And we know it was a miraculous conception. And that's thanks to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and God, the Trinity, was there at creation, even before um, the, the Immaculate Conception. So in Genesis already, we, we know that they're together. We also know from the Gospels that the Holy Spirit was with Jesus when he was performing all those miracles. And we know that the Holy Spirit stayed with Jesus, that he was loyal. When everybody else abandoned him, all those wonderful disciples that were going to stick by his side, the Holy Spirit was the only one that stuck there. And it was the Holy Spirit that was with Christ on Resurrection Day, on Easter. So the Holy Spirit was a part of Jesus' life on earth, I believe, his entire life. And so I think that he merits a little bit of attention. Another interesting thing is that Jesus told the disciples that the Holy Spirit couldn't come to the earth until he left the earth. And so... I have no memory for you. Huh? 
Hi, come on in and join us. So the Holy Spirit was there from the beginning to the end of Christ's life. And that's why I think that they were such good friends. What does this mean to you? Do you have a best friend? Think about these things. Do you have several people that you're really close to? I mean, it could be a spouse. It could be, you know, a real good friend. It could be a sibling. Does this person only have a positive influence on your life? Or do they tend to drag you down? Because then maybe they're not such a good friend. Do they give you only good advice? Do they only want good things for you? Or do they kind of stab you in the back once in a while? <laughs> to me, this is the sign of a good person. If I'm around somebody and I become a better person, that's a true friend. If I can become a better human being, then those are people that I want to be around. And here's a real question for you. What kind of friend are you to other people? Do you have all these positive qualities? My point is that we all need friends. Jesus needed the Holy Spirit. He was God in human form, but he still needed to, um, to have somebody, some kind of a companion. And so many times we as people think that we can go it alone for whatever reason, depression, we're stubborn, whatever the reason. And I know what I'm talking about because when I was young, Simon and Garfunkel were the big thing. And, um, and they had a song called I Am A Rock. And that song became my life. I, had, I was in a place that there was just so much hurt and so much pain that it was easy to get into that song to take care of it, to just get rid of it. And to this day, when I hear these words from the song, I remember the pain that I was in and where I was emotionally at the time. And there were words like, I have no need of friendship. Friendship causes pain. Why bother with friends? It hurts. And then there were the words, and these, these became my life. I have my books and my poetry to protect me. I'm shielded in my armor, hiding in my room. We tend to isolate ourselves, and that's never healthy. But that was how I coped with things. And the last, I justified all of this with the last lines of the song. Because the song ends, and a rock feels no pain, and an island never cries. So it was easier to shut down all of my emotions than it was to deal with things in life. And I was young, and I didn't have the tools, and I didn't have the support that I needed to deal with it. Fortunately, God put people in my life that taught me how to have those emotions again, and you really have to learn how to feel. I mean, when you have shut that down, you do become like a rock. And God needs to chisel away at that. And, and, and these people helped me through that, and they taught me how to love again. And I became a human being again because I had all of those emotions. Jesus was now in his human form, and he needed to have a friend and companion. And that's what the Holy Spirit was to him. My prayer for you is that you all have somebody that important and helpful in your lives and that you would be the kind of person that would be that way in other people's lives. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, you came and were such an example to us. You began your ministry by showing us that we can't go through life alone. As we begin to study the influence of others in your life on earth, help us evaluate the people that we surround ourselves with. But most important, Lord, give everyone here a Holy Spirit friend, someone who is with them when they need them, someone there for the long haul, someone with the best advice and direction someone who we're connected with deep in our souls, Lord. We ask that you bless the rest of our time together this evening. 
in your holy name. Amen. Well, thank you. Um, please come and join us at a table here. Okay. Okay. <laughs>